Okay. So what I'm talking about, so, so the, the topic today is multifractals and a number two questions I want to ask about multifractals. So it'll take me a while to work through exactly what I mean by multifractals and to the construction of an artificial multifractal. Um, and then the two questions that I want to ask is about what one can do with data. So, um, what I'm talking about is just spatial pattern and how one can actually look at spatial pattern. So here are some examples of what one can, can see. So this is a, an older set of data on rainfall and the point that I'm really wanting to emphasize is that if you look at the rainfall, the, um, let me just, sorry, moment, okay, um, if you look at these blocks of color, they're solid color as if there's an unvarying quantity in here. And that of course comes from the idea that these are contours of a smooth function and so um, the, the, you get uniform density at a fine enough scale. Um, this is a much more recent um, version of the same basic phenomenon, the annual rainfall. Um, and if you look at this, you see very much more detail. And if you zoom, the, the, the areas that were solid color in the first one are no longer solid color in this, just because you've zoomed in. Here's another example, the South African vegetation map. Um, and here it's um, just the, how many, one, two, three, four, nine vegetation types that they have there. And each vegetation type is just with one color as if it's just a, a uniform quantity. But if you zoom in, and this is um, where I'm speaking from, then you see that there is extremely fine detail and if you go deeper into more recent versions of the map, then areas that are solid color here also become more detailed. And so the idea is that as you zoom in, you keep seeing more detail. Um, so what I want to talk about then is, um, I want to mention my co-workers, Edith Perrier, Tony Rebello, and Richard Barnes. Um, Edith and I did the mathematics, Tony and Richard gave us some data. So I want to just look at um, spatial statistics in general and the idea of multifractality and the quantification of multifractality via the Renyi dimensions. And now one can study multifractals by using an analytically known multifractal and it has a parameter B, so the MFP 1P2 has a parameter B and it can be seen as a quantification of multifractality and I want to show six different values for B and um, I think this has implications for ecology and for the species area relationship in ecology which I want to discuss briefly and then I want to discuss a question of um, the parameter B and whether the estimates that I report have in a statistical sense any sort of confidence that one can attach to them. So, um, so let me see how I go. Um, so this is the summary of what I want to say. Multifractality is widespread and it can be quantified but exactly what the quantification statistically can imply is not settled. Okay, so if you have, if you want a spatial description, you want to quantify something, your first problem is the problem of correlation. So just because there are points in space, there's an inherent um, correlation quant um, property that the points have just because if you have a given point, some points are near and other points are further and that in introduces an underlying correlation irrespective of anything else, which means that your standard assumption of independently identically distributed data cannot actually apply. 
and you have to have some kind of correlation structure that you talk about. Um, another point is that spatial data is very expensive to obtain, except perhaps through um, video processing. Um, and so you want to not to have to collect too much data. Um, the problem of the correlation was first addressed by a South African mining engineer called Kricher. And there's a classic book by Cressy. And in both cases, the variation is modeled as a differentiable function. And you take it for granted that there are places where you just don't have data, and so you're going to have to do interpolation. Um, and then the statistical details of how that interpolation is done is very interesting, but I'm not talking about that today. Um, so the multifractal idea is completely different. Instead of a differentiable function, we have a function that's nowhere differentiable. So the density function is actually a nowhere differentiable function, and there's very little more to the idea of multifractals than that. So we assume we have a density function rho from R2 to R on a compact set and it's an integrable function and there is no further assumption, particularly it's not assumed to be smooth. Um, if we replace the range with a finite set, that doesn't really matter whether we take our values from real numbers or from a few natural numbers. Um, and the basic idea is that if the density is multifractal, it never smoothed out. So if you take two halves of a whole, they will not have the same value. And if you subdivide them, again, each of their two halves will not have the same value, and so on. And um, what you then have is a tessellation. So we have our domain omega and we make a tessellation the objects are the same area and the same characteristic are. So you can think of a rectangle which is tessellated by squares or rectangles all of the same size with the same characteristic things are. We're going to take the limit as r goes to zero but what are we taking the limit of? Well, every tile has an integral which gives us what we might call the mass of the tile. So tile i has mass m sub i, the total mass is the sum of the m i, and so the content of tile i is just the ratio between the mass on that tile of the total mass. And so the p sub i's all add up to 1, and when we take a power of q, we can take this, it's like a peculiar but also interesting fraction, this is meant to be just uh, L'Hopital's rule, the limit as Q goes to 1 of that. And um, <coughs> the, um, this quantity is settled down and it's a function of Q. So the D, which we compute like this, is a function of Q. When we want to do data fitting, we don't have to take Q from minus infinity to infinity. Um, we need only a few integers. Q uh, equal to positive infinity has actually be, been given a meaning in terms of quantities that have been defined elsewhere. But I'm not talking about that today either. Okay, so... Um, this Renyi dimensions d of q is an interesting object. When we take q equals naught, then d of naught is the fractal dimension or the possibly fractal dimension. If it's, for instance, just a solid square, then d of naught is 2. Um, and d of 1 is the information dimension, the Shannon information, also of rho. d is a non-increasing function. And d is a constant function if and only if it all scales 
the content P sub I is itself a constant function. In that case, the density is not a multifractal. But, because D of naught, so D of naught would be then be equal to D of 1, because D of naught could be a fraction, not be equal to the same uh, as the dimension in which the object is embedded, the object itself, the presence-absence pattern, could be a fractal, but the density on the presence-absence uh, pattern is not a fractal. And so fractality and multifractality are essentially different attributes of the geometric object with which we want to describe the spatial pattern that we're looking at. We can compute approximate values for observed values of the Renyi dimension. Um, and essentially all we do is we take a, the P sub i to the Q and we take the log of the sum of all of them and we plot that versus log r. Its slope is a multiple of d of q, and so it's proportional to d of q, and so we can estimate d of q just using least squares. And the multiple is exactly known. I'm just don't going to try and talk about it. Um, so we can, therefore, for data, when we want to describe like the maps, like those rainfall or vegetation maps I showed you. When we have a map like that, we can do the, through this whole process. Um, let me just... We can, for every tile in our map, we can tessellate our map, then for every tile, we can compute the total mass in the tile, so we can get P sub i for every tile. As we change our R values, we can get... Um, a, all of these values, not analytically, just by observation, and then using this approach, which is standard for fractals, we can get a multifractal. All we're doing is um, repeatedly using the fractal algorithm, but for different values of Q, and then we can plot D of Q. Now here is MFP 1, P2. And we start with a density row which, without loss of generality, we can just set equal to 1 on omega. We have P1 and P2. P1 is not smaller than P2, and both can be interpreted as probability, probabilities. Unfortunately, this P sub 1 and P sub 2 is, of course, different from the P sub i from before. We assume that omega is a rectangle. We construct a multiplicative cascade as follows. So this is our initial omega with the integral equal to 1. We divide it into 2 and we multiply 1 by P1 and we multiply 1 by P2 and so this is the content on each of the two sub-rectangles. Then we multiply P1 by P2 and P1, so we get P1 squared and P1, P2, and similarly for P2 we multiply it by P2 and P1, and so we get P2 squared. And then we do the same. This P1 is then multiplied by P1 and P2, P1 squared. P2 squared is multiplied by P1 and P2. P1, P2 is multiplied by P1 and P2, and P2, well, P1, P2 is again multiplied by P1 and P2, and so we get P1 cubed, P2 cubed, P1 squared, P1 squared, P1 squared, P1, P2 squared, P1, P2 squared, P1, P2 squared, and P2 cubed. So this is just the standard cubic expansion of P1 plus P2. So this is just P1 plus P2 to the third, and, of course, as we go on, of the K bisections, area of each of these rectangles, so this area is one, and it's become a half there, and then it's become a quarter, and it's become an eighth. So each rectangle has a known size, 2 to the minus K, 
and the masses, P1 to the J, P2 to the K minus J, J are binomially distributed. So we know the density analytically in a very simple way. And if we substitute it into the formula for DQ, we can simplify it out to that. So this B is just the ratio between P1 and P2. It must be bigger than or equal to 1. And now we can say that we have a, a multifractal MFP1, P2 with known values of the Renyi dimensions. It's equivalent to what is sometimes called the multifractal spectrum F of alpha, and you can um, go backwards and forwards between F of alpha and D of Q, but there is some variation in formalism and terminology, and here's a reference for somebody who's trying to sort it people who are trying to sort it out and they are proposing um, uh, terminology. I'm not sure that I fully agree with that that's the right way to go, but at least they mention all of the different terms and how to deal with them. Okay, so now if we've got this mfp one p 2 which is analytically known, and we have data for which we can estimate dq, what can we do with that? And the answer is we can try and fit MFP1, P2 to data. And I want to show you some examples, but before I do that, I want to say that actually there's a good case to be made that Q, when you do your fit to data, focus only on positive Q. And here I show what happens when you do some simulations. Um, in this case, I set P1 plus P2 equal to 1. I do MFP1, but I stop after a certain number of bisections. And at low density, I make it 0, 1. So at low density, it becomes individuals. The, if this happens, then you start having empty cells. And that means that your fractal dimension, your, your your density starts having an actual fractal dimension, but in order to compare it with um, observed DQ, uh, it, sorry, in order to observe, to, to compare it with the theoretical values of MFP1, P2, I want the D naught value of the fitted of the observed DQ to be equal to 2, which is uh, achieved by doing this, and you rescale all of them in this way and then you can compare the two curves. And here's a good fit. So the blue curve is from the simulation, the artificial data stopping at k max equals 5 and using 4,000 individuals to start with and having a p1.7 and, uh, and a p2.3 so the ratio is 7 to 3. If I change nothing except the ratio, then I see that the observed and expected don't quite agree for negative values, but they agree for positive values. And on the other hand, if I change the number of individuals, I can also see that it gets worse, but again, it's just for negative. It's interesting that here the blue is above and there the blue is below. So the effect of having a bigger value for B, here B is 4 rather than 7 over 3, um, is not quite the same as that, and there's also an effect for K max, for the 5. All of these things lead to different trade-offs. Um, if you can make observations with more individuals, that's good. And if you can do your subdivisions to find a scale, that's very good. But they are expensive. If your B is large, it might be important to do this. On the other hand, if you use only Q greater than naught, then smaller N naught and Q K work quite well. <coughs> and I will show examples of using Q 
of all of both positive and negative and also of using Q only positive. Okay, so my three data sets that I want to show you. Um, the South African Bird Atlas, South African Protea Atlas, and Dianbilla Bay. So I'm looking at species richness, and this is where I want to talk about the South African uh, the species area relation. Um, and here I'm looking at actual pattern, density pattern of individuals rather than um, of numbers of species. The other difference is that the actual plot in, in the Anvilla Bay was very small compared to, to these which are gigantic um, South Africa, Zimbabwe <coughs> and Namibia and this is the entire Cape region, region in a strict sense um, which is small compared to this but still gigantic compared to the other one so this is just a view of the data. I just want you to get a sense of what it looks like if you count the number of kinds of birds and you make 15 minute by 15 minute tetrads, which is um, so a minute um, in longitude um, is about 1.5 kilometers in, in the Cape Town, but it's not constant throughout the Southern African region. And of course in latitude it's, it's about 1.8 kilometers. Um, and so this is maybe um, 90 kilometers by maybe 75, 60 to 75 kilometers. Um, and this is what the picture looks like. So here in the Nama, there's a very low density of different kinds of birds, but you get bits of Namibia where you see very, very many different kinds of birds. And then all along the coast you see a very large number of birds, but everywhere the numbers of birds go up and down. What is curious is that even in this area here, where there's very, very rich values of birds, you get some low values. And even in here, where there's very low values, you see occasional peaks of richer values. So this is the contrast between rich and poor occurring all the way, which to me is a signal of multifractality. Um, um, so, what next happens is that we've got to try and work out, um, if you remember the computation of D of Q requires R to go to zero, so we want to put a slope to a curve with, with area that is quite a wide range of orders of magnitude. And so what we do is for every one of these little squares, we just take a few bigger squares all around it and all around it, bigger and bigger areas, and that gives us an area A, and then we get the total number of species reported for area A, for S. We don't count the where there's no observations like there or there or in the C. They don't contribute to A, and of course they don't contribute to S. And if we do this, and we use negative and positive values for Q, we get the observed using a non-deterministic algorithm that will become relevant later, so that's why there's more than one value for the blue squares. And we find the MF P1, P2, D1, DQ value for the best value for B that we can find. So the red line is fitted and the blue one line is the data and we fit it using positive and negative values of Q. If we look at the AC, it's much finer. This is now almost it's just less than 2 by 2 kilometers. 
and the the colors that I'm going to show you are the same scale of colors as the South African bird atlas um, and you can see that the range of color is actually more widespread. I'm sorry about the low resolution. Um, and the contrasts are sharper than in the case of the bird atlas. The underlying pattern is also more fractal, but um, because we don't count any blank squares, we don't actually end up with a, a fractal dimension. We have a non-fractal pattern on top of a fractal. By the same technology we get this curve and, and you might be able to notice that this is a much steeper curve and we need a larger B value for the proteaceae than for the birds. If we look at the Envilla Bay, we're looking at the microfauna, which are the tiny little um, worms and tiny little organisms. When I say tiny, they may be two, three millimeters. Things below a millimeter or so are not counted. And very large things, like 10, 20 centimeters or so, they're also not counted. So what happens is that it's a hectare, it's just about the size of a, a sports field, and it's divided up into 256 squares. It's completely regular. But inside each square, only one core is taken. So the actual area is tiny, and it's simply taken that this tiny sampled area is representative of the entire square in which it, it, from which it was taken. And if you look at, this is the abundance of all of the species together, all of the ones that were found. Black is zero, there's only one black square in the entire thing, and as you get higher and higher, closer um, to the yellow, it becomes um, richer and richer and richer. So if we plot this abundance versus area, this is what we see. So um, these are the one by ones, which I've just showed you. So this set of 256 counts there becomes this uh, 256 dots here, ex 255 because the zero is excluded from here, because this is logarithm. And um, then we make it two by one, and so you can see that one of them um, has the same count, but the rest tend all to be go higher. Then that's two by two, four by two, four by four, 4 by 8, 8 by 8, and so on. Eventually you get 16 by 16. And what is characteristic of this is that as you have your smaller, your, your, the component tiles in your tessellation become very small, then the spread is wider. And so you get this triangular shape in a log-log plot. So this is the overall abundance, and now we fit it only for positive Q, and we get a B of 1.375. Um, and if I look at all the different data, the proteas is 1.39. As I said, it's bigger than the birds, which is 1.2. And the DN Villa all species 1.38, Proteas 1.39, so they're very similar. If you look at individual DN Villa species, um, I just selected three values because this was the biggest one and that was one of the smallest of the individual species, just to show you that there's a spread. We had, I think, 10 different species. Um, 
Okay, so these are not strictly comparable. This 1.39 and 1.38 were done. This is with all the Q values. This is only positive Q values. Um, and these are species presence absence, and these are individual presence absence. So abundance. So total abundance rather than total number of species. Okay. Um, so the first question that I want to ask is, is the species area relationship a function? I won't spend too much time on this. The um, idea is that the S is equal to C times A to the Z. And if we try to follow this up and we use the data that I've showed, the South African Protea Atlas data, this is for large, um, for, for a very, very large number of data. I'm actually showing just a few of the points. And um, I'm also showing the, in two different, so these are actually superimposed data, but I'm showing them in two different graphs because it would just become obscured if you um, look at what happens. So this is, um, e the, all of these circles are a K by K tetrad, but they don't all contain, so this is very large, this is K is, is, is nearly one of the largest, so um, many of the little cells inside the tetrad are not counted, and so this is why this ends up as a, as a whole range of different areas and corresponding range of different um, of different counts of numbers of species and as you go towards smaller and smaller k by k tetrads it becomes noisier um, so um, I can get up um, So the smaller ones are noisier and the, the bigger ones become threads. So we can fit this using, um, if, we, if we just attempt to parameterize S equals C times A to the Z, as I may not have mentioned, um, C S times C times A to the Z, there's another one, um, these two are the classical ones, but there are another 21 different formulae, function types. A function type means it's, uh, the functions all have the same form, but they differ only in the value of the parameters. They have the same parameters. And um, the Arrhenius form is the most dominant these days, um, but I'm not sure that it's fundamental. I think it's just that it's very influential writings by Preston. Um, so, now we fit this to the data I've shown you, and depending on how we actually do the fit, we get a wide range of different items. So, if we allow the tetrads to overlap, then, and we use an unstructured um, thing, so this is basically using all of these, all of this data is used to just fit one straight line and then we get A1. Alternatively, if we first put them together into subregions, and they are disjoint, and we just compare all the different subregions, then we get this value. If we use a completely different item, so what we now do is, for the nested tetrads, each tetrad here, this tetrad, is actually nested inside a tetrad there, which is nested inside a tetrad there, which is nested inside there, and, um, and we get a sequence, we get a line from, if we go to the, to the very smallest ones, they occur over here, we get a set of lines across, one for each tetrad, it's a very, very large number of different lines, it's a, thousands of them, and if we get those lines and we take the average and that's what we get. 
if we don't go all the way to the whole region limit, so again, we have these tetras that come up from below, but we don't go all the way to the top, we only go into the sub-regions and we stop there on the grounds that these are ecologically related, ecologically coherent areas, and we should try and look at the SAR as a ecologically meaningful, only in ecologically meaningful units, then we get quite a difference. Finally, if we take the sub-regions and instead of just being an unstructured one with all the sub-regions, we now make combinations from smaller to larger combinations of sub-regions we accrete. So we start with a sub-region, we put in the ones that adjoin it, we put in the ones that adjoin those, and we get, for every sub-region, we get a, quite a few larger ones. And so this is again an average of many fits. And then this is again different. There's also a difference that you can see between the A to B3, which are using sub-regions, and they are vaguely similar to each other. And then these ones are the ones that use the tetrads, starting with very small tetrads. So the sub-regions are never very small. These ones go down to very small areas. So there's a kind of similarity between them, but they're very different from these. And we're using exactly the same data in the end. It's the same raw data. So we get all these essentially incompatible values. There's no real reason to prefer the one to the other. And on that basis, um, I want to say that we should abandon the idea that there is a best set of values. If I can just go back. My computer is unfortunately responding very slowly at the moment. Um, if I can just go back. There's no reason to, to say that any of these pairs is better than the other. And so there's no reason to say that this has a correct version. There's no correct version for the best fit. So, I think that it comes from the fact that the underlying density is multifractal. And so the idea of smoothness, this is really the SAR comes from some sort of idea of smoothness, that is actually invalid. So I'm, I'm arguing against the SAR in the context of this presentation because I want to say that the phenomenon I've just been pointing out um, is an indication that the underlying object is not smooth. Okay, so now I've been talking about um, multifractality and V values, and I am running out of time. Um, <clears throat> if we go back to what we saw, the fitted B values and all these different values, we might want to ask, does this indicate a degree of multifractality? Differences in the degree of multifractality. It's basically differences in that the local contrast is more extreme or less extreme. So it's a, more, it's a wilder or a less wildly varying object. And we could claim, for instance, that the South African Protea Atlas that is similar multifractality as the Dian Villa overall abundance. And both of them are more multifractal than the birds, but less multifractal than individual abundances. So the pooled abundance is less wild than the individual abundances. But unfortunately, we could only say that if we can say that B values are actually different. So on what basis could we say that? Okay, so the non-deterministic algorithm that I mentioned before runs on saying that you've got lots and lots of A values. If you have too many A values, then what you do is you just randomly use only some of them. And that means that every time you run this algorithm, you get slightly different values of these Q. And we can actually get some sort of least squares analysis out of that. But 
this might seem to indicate that once we run this and we get a very large number of avers, you just sample incredibly intensively and we just use a very wide range of ways of generating A values, then we have such a large thing that we can now have lots of different estimates and in some sense as we increase and increase and increase the number of areas we're looking at, we would hope that our least square split settles down. But we don't know whether the value of B might be strongly influenced by the method used to construct the areas, as, um, which is exactly my objection to the idea of a species area relationship. And so I was saying the species area function, uh, say the uh, exponential C times A to the Z that was used, um, is that that's not, I would say, a property of the underlying data set because the underlying data set is multifractal. But I'm now using a concept B which is actually supposed to be used for multifractals. And so I want to claim that it truly is a pattern, that's a property of the underlying pattern. But I don't see how I can actually get to that um, claim. For instance, if we use different triangles, if we use other kind of ways of putting things together, we can put things together in completely peculiar shapes, not squares inside squares, or we just use scaled shapes, which are the same shapes as CFR or whatever. Um, and we, um, we get something which is clearly not a tessellation, despite the fact that the theory was developed for tessellation, but this actually seems to give us good values. I don't know if this is acceptable. So if you, for instance, do a very fine scale, K equals 50. So we did experiments like this, but not for such a fine scale. It's computationally very expensive. And we actually tried out distribution of A, and we got values. It worked really well, but actually there's a problem. Which shape should we accept? If we have a given shape, what is the probability distribution? Um, just to very quickly go through one particular sort of objection that becomes possible. If you, ha you just want to have all the rectangles with a corner at the bottom left, and then the x wide and one of x high. So they all have an area of one. And so this is a question of just all of the rectangles of area one which have their bottom left corner over there. Which of those do we want to choose? Even if we say, okay, L must at least be bounded so that we can don't get impossibly thin and tall rectangles, and we want uh, a probability dis distribution for X in all of this, so now we're just choosing our X. That is not enough. Do we choose it uniformly? Do we choose it uniformly along the um, hyperbola? Or something, do we have the, we want the distribution that has the maximum entropy among all of these in here? It's not clear to me how one should choose this. And so there seems to be no a priori way of deciding how to do your search. But as I said, our experiments show that if you actually do a purely algorithmic approach, you try things out, then you get fits that fit reasonably well. The, B, the fitted B value is actually close to the value used to generate the artificial data. So I see these difficulties, but in practice it appears that they don't matter too much. Um, for real shapes and real data, things are much more difficult. And um, all I can say is that although smoothness is a very convenient assumption, it's a case where the models are wrong but useful. I think the situation is that it's actually incorrect, it's not at the heart of what nature is doing. And I would hope that if I could find a way of justifying um, this um, procedure here, where you just actually artificially just generate a large number of areas and use them and your B values are close to your MFP values for 
for artificial data, and then we just go ahead and say, well, this is good for also for real data. And I would hope that that's possible. Thank you very much.